Okie diddly doodly, neighborinos. So let's go ahead and get started. Like I said, uh, they're going to be taping all semester long. So if you come in late, it's probably best if you come in through the back door. And so if you two or three guys right there would probably generally try to keep those seats open, so maybe move up, I don't know. That way if people come in late, they can, would that be a huge issue if people are walking in or not really or? All right, so basically try to fill up this side first rather than to leave kind of these couple of slots over here for students that come in late, if that makes sense. Okay. So let's kind of start off here with our um, discussion. So the father of economics is generally considered a guy by the name of Adam Smith. And he wrote a book in 1776 called The Wealth of Nations. <coughs> By the way, I have really bad handwriting. I'm going to try to do my best to make it good for you, but I generally say everything that I write. I basically almost write everything that I say. Okay. So Adam Smith was a Scottish economist, and legend has it, and I'm going to draw this picture of, you know, here's Lower England and here's Scotland. So we have Scotland up here. All right, we've got Lower England here. And the history is, the myth, the rumor, whatever, as he's going from Scotland to England, he notices that basically as soon as he crosses the border, everything in England is better. People are richer, they're better educated, they're wealthier, the kids live longer, infant mortality rates are lower. Basically, every single metric that you could think of to say, and compare life in one country to another, it's better in England than it is in Scotland. Okay? And this gets him to thinking about why is this, right? I mean, we have the same language, similar culture, similar religion, right? What is it that makes nations wealthy, right? Because up until this point, you have a system called mercantilism And mercantilism says, well, what makes a country rich is gold and silver, right? So under mercantilism, you have this idea that you want gold and silver coming into the country. In other words, you want lots of exports, right? So we're going to export goods and services. We're going to have gold and silver coming in. That's what makes the country wealthy if we have lots of gold and silver, right? What kind of goods and services can we make and sell to other people? And then there's gold and silver coming in. That's what makes the country wealthy. Right? That was the system of mercantilism. And Adam Smith says, no, I don't think that's right. He says, what makes the countries wealthy is something different than that. This is a completely different way of thinking about the world. Now, what other significant event happens in 1776? Declaration of Independence, right? It is not coincidence that the Declaration of Independence and the Wealth of Nations both come out in the same year. That's not coincidence, right? Because people over here in America are saying to themselves, look, we have this king over here who's saying, do this, do that. We don't think that's the way the world works. We think people are smart enough to figure things out on their own. We think people have political freedom. Adam Smith comes along and says essentially the exact same thing except under the kind of guys of economics. And here, in essence, he's saying, look, in essence, what you can do is you can have an invisible hand can solve a lot of these economic problems. All right? Because, in essence, what you have at this time, you've got countries like France that will have 13,000 different regulations Right, on how to build a chair. Not 13,000 different regulations total. 13,000 different regulations on how to build a chair. Right? 
If you have 13,000 different rules on how to build a chair, is making a chair easy or is it hard? That's going to be pretty hard, right? And you know some of these regulations counteract each other, right? This regulation says the chair must be no higher than 32 inches, and there's another regulation that says the chair must be no lower than 32 inches or whatever, right? And Adam Smith says, look, you don't need all this. If you're a company building chairs and your chairs collapse when people sit in them, you're going to go out of business. If you're a company that makes chairs and when you sit in your chairs, people are comfortable and the chair doesn't collapse, you're going to stay in business. The invisible hand is going to say, these people that are making products well are going to stay in business. These people that don't make products well are not going to stay in business. You don't need the government coming in and saying, we have all these different regulations on how you're going to build things. In essence, he's saying, just like you have over here in the U.S., in Philadelphia, in 1776, people saying, look, we don't need the government coming in and saying all this stuff. People are smart enough to figure these things out for themselves. It's the exact same thing over here. Right? It's an entirely different new way of thinking about the world. Okay? So let's look at the economic problem in detail. All right? There it is. That's what we do. How are we going to turn resources into goods and services? This is what economists deal with. Right? And what we have here is that these resources are limited and scarce, meaning that there's not an infinite amount of them. And since we're not God, we cannot create goods and services out of thin air. We have to use these resources to make these goods and services. That means these guys are going to be limited and scarce. So which goods and services do we produce? How are we going to produce them? Which sets of resources do we use to make those goods and services? That's what economists do. Economics is really a decision science. Right? It is not something to deal with stocks and bonds. We have stuff to say about that, but it's basically a decision science. Which sets of resources do we want to turn into goods and services? How are we going to turn those resources into goods and services? How are we going to distribute those resources, those goods and services, etc.? That's what economics is all about. Right? If economics was about picking stocks and bonds, and people ask me that all the time, well, what stock should I buy? Dude, I don't know. If I knew what stock to buy, I wouldn't be working, right? If your broker knew what stock to buy, he would not be working. <coughs> this is what economists deal with, right? We turn with these resources and these goods and services. So let's kind of define some terms here. We kind of have an idea of what scarcity is. Scarcity is the fact that there are insufficient resources to produce all the goods and services that people want. Right. So you're going to have to make a choice. Basically, that's what that says. All right, which should be obvious. So we know that these guys are limited and scarce. We know we can't create these guys out of thin air. Therefore, these guys are going to be limited and scarce. How are we going to distribute them? That's economics in a nutshell. What we study is how do we get from here to here? That's what we study. So when we're looking at these goods and services, let's look at these different types. We've got goods, um, right? 
things that are scarce and desirable. beyond what is freely available. All right, so here's our goods, stuff that basically all the goods and services are is just stuff that we want. All right? But it doesn't have to be tangible things. Right? Leisure time is a good stuff that we want. All right? So we have these economic goods And we've got these economic bads. Right? So our economic bads are things that we don't want. Things that are undesirable. Pollution, crime, etc. Right? So economists are interested in, well, okay, what sets of goods and services do we want? What sets of goods and services and things do we don't want? The economic balance we don't want. And how are we going to achieve that, right? And the, this definition might not be the same for everything, right? So for example, here's a pizza. So when it was just my wife and I, we could get a buy, we could get by with just ordering one pizza because there was just two of us. Now we have three kids and we have to get like four or five, but that's another story. So here's our pizza here, right? So she hates pepperoni pizza. She hates it. So I love it, right? So I'm getting half pepperoni, we're getting half cheese, and invariably. You're going to get a little bitty piece of pepperoni on that little slice of pizza, and that whole piece of pizza is now infected, right? It's not a matter of I'm going to pull the pepperoni off and eat this cheese pizza. It's the whole slice is infected. And so when it comes to eating, she's eating this part right here, right? So here's her, and then here's me eating all this part, right? Yay me, right? And that's why my cholesterol is at... 712 and hers is at 110. I don't, I don't know what my cholesterol is. All right? But the point is, is that to me, pepperoni pizza is an economic good. I like it. To her, it's an economic bad. Right? So it's not that there's a universal definition for goods and bads. The goods are just stuff that you desire. The bads are things that you don't desire. All right? Blessing. Couple of other ideas that we want to keep before we start looking at these resources in more detail. That's the idea of positive economics and normative economics. Positive basically looks at what is. Normative looks at what should be. Or what ought to be. So these guys right here are testable. These guys right here are value judgments. Okay. So let's look at an example. Federal budget deficit should be smaller. The 
federal budget deficit is $300 billion. The minimum wage should be increased. Increasing the minimum wage increases arrow going up, increases arrow going down, decreases, increases the unemployment rate. among black males. Got four statements here. One, two, three, four. Which guy's positive, which guy's normative? The federal budget deficit should be smaller. Positive or normative? Normative, normative right? This guy is normative. Federal budget deficit is $300 billion. Positive or normative? Positive. positive. Is it true? Maybe, but it's still a positive statement. Minimum wage should be increased, positive or normative? Normative. Increase in minimum wage increases unemployment among black males, positive or normative? Positive. Is it true? Maybe. Maybe. The idea here is that it's testable. Maybe increasing the unemployment, uh, the minimum wage makes unemployment among black males goes down. Maybe it has no effect. The point is that it's a testable hypothesis. You can go out and you can collect data and you can see whether it's true or not. These guys are untestable hypotheses. They're value judgments, right? The minimum wage should be increased. Somebody else says, well, I think it should go down. We're done. All right? There's nothing left to say. So generally speaking, what type of economics do you think we want to do, positive or normative? Positive, right? Because this right here is like, we're done. What else can you say? All right, All right we'll pick it up from here uh, on Friday.